Okay, then let's continue with our investigation, exploration, and explanation of the um, Great Recession. Let's link the the Great Recession to before we get into the specific causes. Let's let's think of the, the sort of grand theory, if you like, um, or greater, you know, big ideas explaining um, explaining. And in fact, let's start with the theory that, well, financial markets left alone will not generate um, or don't or, or should be left alone because in doing so, they, they create wealth um, most efficiently. And this is, of course, the efficient market hypothesis, which goes back a long time within the economics, the field of economics, but is most popularized in modern, modern years by um, Eugene Farmer. It broadly says that, well, if we assume that people are rational, then free markets will ensure that prices reflect all the available information and that beating the markets is, is essentially impossible. And anyone, any particular investor who seems to beat the market uh, is just lucky. Um, because the market is, has processed all the information and uh, evaluated the, the value of a share or an asset um, at, its, at, 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 at its sort of fundamental price. Now, why do I bring this up? Because, of course, um, if you accept the efficient market hypothesis, then it has great implications for regulation of the financial sector. Because, you know, the likes of uh, the Chicago School economists like Farmer and, and others is that uh, they, they say that, well, you know, the, the financial markets, the only, the only way you can kind of bring um, a great deal of, of disturbance into that market is by not letting it be free in, the, in some broad sense of the word. Um, and so that has implications then for the legal framework, um, especially when it comes to regulation of financial markets. If you accept this hypothesis, it means you will probably you know, reduce the amount of regulation. And I thought in this context, it would be interesting to, uh, there was a great, I think, book written by uh, Donald Langerfort, or no, it was a paper, a long paper, um, where he discusses some of the implications of the efficient market hypothesis for the uh, legislation at the Securities and Exchange Commission, so the sort of regulator of financial markets in the US. Um, and so he begins by saying the efficient market hypothesis has a strong presence in the contemporary culture of securities regulation. Its central insight that a variety of forces impound available information into stock prices fast enough that arbitrage opportunities cannot be exploited systematically began as an important theory in the economics literature. Later, it became a working tool for legal scholars and then diffused into law as, as both the SEC and the courts began to cite it as authority for a variety of concepts and initiatives. So here we're seeing, according to Professor Langevort, that uh, this, this hypothesis um, essentially becomes more and more accepted and taken for granted, um, not only in the field of economics where it originates, but also in the legal uh, field, uh, the, the fields of law and, and, and government even. Um, However, he goes on later to say that the efficiency hypothesis is laden with political content. Its implications are very strong for non-intervention or deregulation in a host of corporate and security law settings. Hostile takeovers, as the course of both the 1980s in particular. If accurate, is in, invocation is plainly in the public interest. If overstated or wrong, the resulting deregulation still produces a shift of wealth from one group to another. Organized interests, he says, that foresee favorable results will treat strong statements of research and those who produce it as a valuable commodity. So what um, Professor Langevort is saying here is that, well, yes, the efficiency hypothesis really matters for regulation and it has clear impacts on distribution as well as well. Uh, it's laden with political content, he says. Um, so I find it interesting that, you know, someone so close to the formation and regulation, um, or at least who was, 
has such a you know deep insight to the potential political nature of, of this um, hypothesis, which has, of course, in more recent years fallen out of favor, especially after the financial crisis. Um, and Professor Posner, who's a leading figure not only in economics but law and, and the sort of um, the the sort of interlinkages between the two fields at the University of Chicago, where the efficient market hypothesis is um, popularized, went on to say after the financial crisis that the movement to deregulate the financial industry went too far by exaggerating the resilience or the self-healing powers of laissez-faire capitalism. So even the former proponents are starting to shift um, their view. Um, this doesn't stop Eugene Farmer from winning a Nobel Prize, I think, a couple of years later, but anyway, we see that this this um, this hypothesis falls in in its thinking. But we also see the strong role as as these these uh, these authors um, kind of attest to in um, in the legal framework, which inspires the rules or lack thereof in financial markets. So, in some sense, one of the causes of this uh, of this crisis, you could say, is well not just not understanding the theory, it's perhaps having counterproductive theory or bad theory. So how can we understand the crisis if not through the lens of efficient market hypothesis? Well, of course, as the efficient market hypothesis fell in popularity, an old hypothesis which was largely ignored for the decades after it was um, created grew in popularity, and that's the financial instability hypothesis of Hyman Minsky. So what is, I won't go into all the details, but luckily enough, the essence is quite easy to distill onto one slide. Minsky essentially takes the post-Keynesian tradition in saying that in order to understand the economy, you must begin with the concept of fundamental uncertainty, which essentially just means that the, you know, economy uh, and the nature of, you know, the, the nature of the economy is that it, you can't understand everything. You can't know everything there is to know about it, especially when you start thinking about the future and what will happen tomorrow or in a year's time or in 10 years time. And that's exactly what financial markets would like to do is to know the price in a year's time of the stock that they are currently buying. So if there is this fundamental uncertainty, this just this um, state of ignorance that we all live in uh, to some extent if that exists then you cannot rationally opt optimize as you would in farmers eugene uh, in farmers efficient market hypothesis so if you cannot rationally optimize how do you make decisions well investors like other people in the economy use rules of thumb so heuristics um, and these rules of thumb often take the form of looking to the past um, so, you know, inflation this year will probably be the same as inflation last year. That's one rule of thumb. Or you can look to what others are doing. If you want to understand, you know, how much inflation will be this year, well, perhaps just, you know, see what the market predicts. So this kind, these kinds of heuristics are reasonable ways of dealing with fundamental uncertainty in many ways. But they are far from, let's say, you know, theoretically optimal especially because what they mean is that if the collective uh, are wrong, then it's kind of self-reinforcing. And it can lead to what is called a collective euphoria, especially when you have a situation where initial profitable investments um, are, yeah, are successful, they are profitable, and then they bolster, they boost the beliefs of uh, those investors who made those investments. and. Uh, they boost the beliefs that, yes, I, as this investor, have an accurate grip on reality. I know the nature of the economy and I know how to make good investments. Um, so, and if you have enough investors um, giving in to this collective euphoria, um, then you get this credit cycle, which is kind of self-fulfilling. It's self-perpetuating. It can detach from the real side of the, the, the economy and the financial bubble can uh, begin to be inflated. This collective euphoria, you know, uh, the initial profitable investments leading to further investment and further investment and further investment uh, breeds in overconfidence and also leads to calls to remove these what Minsk 
supporting institutions. So essentially regulations. Why? Well, because you have a, grow, a growing number of investors who say, we don't need these regulations. All they do is get in the way of profit-making exercises or value-adding exercises. Uh, and increasingly, as the economy continues to grow, even the regulators start to say, okay, perhaps we don't need all this regulation. However, as investment continues to roll and uh, debt con it continues to accumulate, we get through different phases of the credit cycle, which are increasingly inherently risky. And the rising levels of indebtedness increasingly rely on further debt to pay back the debt that is outstanding, as we'll see in a graph in a second. So this is what is meant by the idea that stability is destabilizing. Stability allows for a kind of confidence when, you know, if you have enough stability for an, uh, a long enough time, it means that people start to take that stability for granted and overestimate their investment decision-making capabilities. And here we have the different stages of the credit cycle in relation to, well, the GDP cycle. At the beginning, you have a kind of what Menti calls hedge finance, where you have an amount of debt outstanding, which is actually less than or roughly equal to the amount of income in the economy, such that if you needed to pay back all the debt at once, you would be able to do so. And as the amount of credit or debt increases, then you move on to the speculative finance stage of the credit cycle, whereby any increase in debt, um, may, you may be able to pay it back, but only so long as not everyone tries to pay back uh, debt at the same time, or all the lenders come together and say, okay, all your borrowers must pay back now at once. And lastly, as debt rises even further due to overconfidence, due to this stable period in which GDP and investment and, and credit is rising without any problems, you get to the stage of Ponzi finance, which is inherently unstable because in order to finance the debt that you have outstanding, you must, um, you must borrow even more. And of course, at some points, all you need is a relatively small section of or a relatively small sector in the economy to go bust in order to have what is called the Minsky moment where, well, you have the onset of financial crisis. Perhaps this is Bear Stearns going over, uh, going under, or it is Lehman Brothers uh, in the Great Recession example. This is the moment when the um, expectations, the overconfidence evaporates and instead we are, we are living in a world full of pessimism and um, negative expectations. So this is, this is Minsky's essential insights. Financial cycles are endogenous. They have real effects on the economy and it's fundamentally down to the assumptions we make about the people that we you know, model in a sense. And of course, well, out of the two hypotheses, one is certainly more useful in explaining um, the Great Recession or the global financial crisis. And that, of course, is Minsky's um, hypothesis. The, la the, the downside to Minsky's hypothesis is simply that, well, it doesn't have much predictive value, or it doesn't have a very specific predictive value. So it can be hard to identify a bubble, um, but Minsky sh still, you know, sure enough says, just be, you know, err on the side of caution. Understand that they exist and that they uh, they're not necessarily reliant on, say, some widespread pandemic like that we're living through now, where there's some external shock, but uh, it can be endogenously created within the capitalistic system. So that's, that's the sort of insight there. Okay, so we have a general framework in which to understand the Great Recession, how it was caused. But, you know, Minsky's financial instability hypothesis explains many, financial, explains every, in some sense, financial crisis. So what's special about the Great Recession? Well, we have two sides to consider. The demand for credit, why were so many people demanding so much credit and therefore debt? Um, and the supply of credit, so the financial side, where we have to ask ourselves, why were the banks so willing and ready to create so much credit? So for this side, I'm going to be building on Professor Hines and Professor Stockhammer's contributions in the post-Keynesian literature.
Um, so firstly, and this is the link, I, I won't spend too much time here because it's the link to the, the course so far, we see rising inequality that dampens demand, consumption falls more than investment rises and so on. And we see uh, in response to stagnant domestic demand an increase in export-led and debt-led models which also drive global imbalances, which is another problem in and of itself. But let's focus on this dichotomy of export and debt-led growth. In the debt-led countries, poorer households increasingly need debt to finance even consumption. Why? Well, because their share of income is falling. And in order to maintain a growth of consumption, or even at the very, very lowest end of uh, the, the income um, distribution, the, the poorest households, you know, may, even even in order to maintain the consumption level, they need may need increasing access to credits. So, in the poorer households, inequality is fueling this need for debt in order to finance consumption, and often this is explained with reference to consumption norms. You see what your neighbor, how much your neighbor is consuming, and therefore you say, well, I should be able to afford that, and you go out and you demand debt. Um, on the upper end of the income distribution, we have those richer households which now have more income than ever, more income than they know what to do with in some sense. And so after their consumption needs are met, and after they put uh, their income into the safest assets, there's an increasing demand for riskier assets, as yeah, the amount of income going to the top, you know, 10% or 1% increases. Well you're going to start investing in riskier assets. And the fourth point is, well, so we have this debt-led economy, which is clearly running into some, uh, it's clearly being fueled by increasing inequality. Um, and therefore Minsky's story kind of takes over, at which point you have, yeah, it's running by its own steam, but it's doing so in an unsustainable way. But of course the export-led economies are reliant on these debt-led economies for growth through their trade. So the US financial crisis becomes a global economic crisis because although you know you don't have a housing bubble in Germany necessarily at this time, um, the fact that it is reliant on the US um, for trade, it, it becomes infected. Okay, so we have the demand for credit side of the story. Why, is, why are people demanding credit more than ever? Well, inequality is a large part of the story. On the other side, why are banks supplying all this credit? And in this, I'll be building on the work of James, James Crotty, I can't remember his first name, but Crotty, who's writing in the Cambridge Journal of Economics, who, who uh, summarizes the insights into what he calls the new financial architecture, which was developed since the 1980s. First and foremost, he says, well, it's based on a weak theoretical foundation, and this is largely to do with the efficient market hypothesis. Um, it essentially is not, you know, empirically justified or at least not as strongly as its proponents suggest it is. But more precisely, um, the new financial architecture creates, according to Crotty, these widespread perverse incentives which lead to excessive risk taking. So, for example, mortgage securitization, so taking a mortgage and bundling it into something which can be traded as, as a you know, tradable asset, um, so that's what we mean by securitization. So this mortgage securitization generates fee income. So those mortgage brokers and so on, which um, generate these, these secu securities, um, they make money from doing so regardless of whatever happens to the security after it passes to them. So they have no incentive to ensure that what they're selling will perform well or be sustainable in the future. Um, we have bonuses in these investment banks um, based off the non short term, you know, stock price uh, fluctuations and performances. Uh, credit rating agencies in particular face high demand for the safest rated assets. And if they fail to deliver, you know, uh, the ratings that uh, banks would like, then perhaps those banks will go to other creating credit rating agencies. Um, so the credit rating agencies are implicitly under some pressure to try to, you know, provide the banks their customers with what they want. And then, uh, perhaps but one of the biggest points here is this um, shift to what is called originate and distribute uh, loan granting. And what is meant by originate and loan and uh, distribute is the following. 
So perhaps in the past, you know, in the early 20th century, and for most of the 20th century, you would go to your local commercial bank and you would ask for a loan. And if they found you credit worthy, you would get your loan and the bank would make money off your ability to pay back that loan. However, what happened over time, especially with this new financial architecture, is the idea that the commercial bank should grant loans. It, it should specialize in the um, monitoring of, of, of credit-worthy customers and kind of you know, fill out these risk assessment forms. And if the risk assessment form says, you know, they've got a certain credit score, a certain credit rating, uh, you are worthy of a, of a loan, you then grant the loan, but then you, you sell that mortgage or that loan onto the financial market. So the commercial bank passes that loan along to some other investor with a certain rating. So maybe it's AAA because it's super safe. The person you just sold a mortgage to you know, is a doctor on a guaranteed income, high income and so on. Or maybe it's someone who's unemployed and, and would, you know, has barely any income coming in at all. And so for, and th then you pass it on as a subprime mortgage onto the financial markets. And so with this shift in the way mortgage are, mortgages are and loans are created, we have a strange perverse uh, incentives that are created whereby commercial banks um, you know, uh, are now are kind of doing a tick, uh, a box ticking exercise, whereby they're trying to evaluate the risk of, of the loans they are granting, but they don't really need to go into all that level of detail to ensure that the risk level that they, that they assess is actually accurate. Because, you know, if you see uh, the soft information, as it's called, that's not really to be found on, on, a, on a tick boxing, a box ticking exercise, just simply in the, you know, the other information that you hear and your commercial bank, you hold on to that loan, you're more likely to know the risk of, of defaults and so on. So this, this change in the way uh, banks grant their loans and who owns the, the mortgage at the end of the day really has an effect on how sustainable the, um, the overall market is. Okay, lastly, we have financial innovation, oh, not lastly, actually, but financial innovation created financial products so complex and opaque they could not be priced correctly. And in particular, I'm thinking of collateralized debt obligations, so CDOs, where mortgage-backed securities are accumulated together and then cut up and sold in various tranches, and then you have a CDO square, and essentially it's just ridiculously complicated, to the point where... Even the financial um, you know, analysts that created these models to price these uh, derivatives and products, um, they, they have a price, but there's, in the analysis that's conducted later, there's no real clear way of knowing if that price reflects anything fundamental about the risk of the asset uh, being priced. Um, so the complexity and the opaqueness of these new financial products simply inherently increase the amount of risk. And then we have the side of the, the regulators. So firstly, we have an increasing amount of risky assets that are allowed to be held off the balance sheet. And remember, the balance sheet is important because, you know, you have regulation saying you need a certain capital requirements, um, you know, 10% or whatever, whatever it is, of all your loans have to be backed up by uh, assets that you hold on your balance sheet in case, uh, you know, crisis happens. But if you can tell the regulators, look, this risky asset I just bought, I'm going to sell within the next month, then they don't go onto the balance sheet. And therefore, if you can convince this is just um, meant for trading and trading alone is not long term holding, then the hold of the balance, the held off the balance sheet and uh, the, the regulations don't apply. So that's one way the regulators kind of turn a blind eye to this, this kind of uh, regulatory dialectic. There's a way of getting around the regulations that are puts in front of you. Regulators also allow banks to measure their own risk and to set their own capital requirements effectively through the use of value at risks risk models, which simply fail to capture the real value at risk because they usually assume a normal distribution um, for the defaults of same mortgages, when realistically it is not normally distributed. But we won't go into the specifics there. Okay, so we have the financial side, the supply of credit becomes more plentiful because 
regulation becomes more lax, perception of perceptions of creditworthiness uh, increase, uh, and that we have all these perverse incentives going on um, in the financial sector. Supply of credit increases, demand for credit is increasing due to inequality. Here we have the great build-up of debts, which pushes eventually into a Minsky moment uh, after the Ponzi finance has erupted. Okay, so this is our structuralist or Keynesian explanation of the Great Recession. And the implications are clear. You need to ensure there is a certain amount of regulation and you need to ensure that inequality does not rise too high if you want stability for your economy. Let's briefly go through some of the most important and most interesting consequences of the crisis. And here I really do want to pay attention to politics, race, and gender, because most of everything you'll see in this course will be about the macro economy, but of course, at the end of the day, it's about individual well-being, it's about structural and, and social harmony and so on. And in particular, in this week, when we're discussing, um, yeah, when, when the, the, the public discourse is surrounding so much uh, to do with race, um, yeah, I think it's important to go into these sorts of topics. So. Let's talk about politics. You may have a, uh, it, let's say, anecdotal understanding that after the last financial crisis, we've seen the rise of the far right. So you could put broad hypothesis that there is a link there. And that's, in fact, exactly what um, these German sociologists, I believe they were actually, um, put forward and, and investigated. So their, their um, data set is actually one of the great uh, contributions of their work. It spans from 1870 to 2014 across many countries around the world. And what they're essentially they're trying to see is, well, what is the effect on democracy uh, and policymaking um, after a financial crisis? So in the first table here, we see the change in the vote share of the far right and the far left after a crisis, a financial crisis. Um, and as we can see, well, the far left actually doesn't change that much at all. In fact, it doesn't really change. The far right, on the other hand, clearly has a massive increase from almost 5% to 10%. And this difference in their work, they show is statistically significant at the 5% level. So that anecdotal hypothesis you may have uh, seems to be confirmed from this work. In more recent years, and perhaps using parties that you may not know of, we can see some of that evidence. Um, UKIP in, in the United Kingdom, after, well, after a few years after the Great Recession and austerity and so on, rises considerably, as we see in Denmark, or the equivalent party in Denmark, and in France, and so on. It's not the same in all, all economies, but there clearly is a trend in the last um, few in the last few years for European elections in particular. But let's kind of look beyond just the rise of the far right, as, as um, problematic and scary as that is. What about just the ability for government to govern? How does a financial crisis affect their ability to govern? Now, what we see here is the, the, the vote share. So the, the, the share of parliaments where... Um, by the government, say, so the, the amount of a majority the government has in some sense. And what we see is, well, after the financial crisis, every year after, well, here on average in the post-World War II period, it decreases significantly outside of the confidence interval uh, and then stays quite low uh, in the years that follow. We can look at the opposition vote share, it does the opposite. So that means the fractionalization of parliament, so in some sense a measure of how uh, ununified or disunited um, uh, or fragmented the parliament is rises. So it's the, the parliaments are given parliaments after financial crisis, the years after financial crisis, are less likely to agree on policy. We also see an increase in the number of parties. And again, we can see this in our own sort of anecdotal experience after the Great Recession. Uh, we had the RFD, um, uh, and we, in, in Germany, we have, um, well, UKIP are around in, in Britain before, but their growth really, really increases. Uh, we have Change UK in Britain, but if, essentially in every economy, you see a rise in the number of parties, or there's a tendency at least. 
So this fragmentation doesn't help with policy making. You also see polarization of the voters. Here we have the number of street protests, or general strikes, violent riots, demonstrations, and some of all those things. And the pre and post crisis, well, there's clearly a difference in the two. General strikes, not so much, but violent riots and demonstrations go up quite considerably. Um, okay, and the last thing to discuss related to this paper, a very interesting paper, is that one of the sort of conclusions that financial crises are more dangerous to democracy than non-financial crisis crises. Um, so for, you know, projections of far-right vote shares after a financial recession or financial crisis, we see that um, the far rights are likely to increase and it's statistically significant in, according to their analysis. I've only uh, taken a snapshot of some of, you know, some of the table. Um, and that's quite different to a non-financial macro disaster, say like, for example, coronavirus that we're going through right now. Uh, the rise of the far right historically has not been statistically significant after financial macro disaster relative to a financial uh, crisis, which I find really quite interesting. And one of the things they say in this paper, which was, I think, released in 2015, yeah, was that, um, in fact, they find a kind of coming together after a non-financial macro disaster weather related or in the current situation disease related and we see that at least in, to some extent in, in the coronavirus crisis where people come together and say we're going to get through this whereas in a financial recession there's a lot more uh, disunity and we have a similar thing that's seen for street protests. Okay so we see the effect of financial crisis on the political system. Let's think about health, race and gender and before we finish. Um, Suicide? Well, unfortunately, the evidence is quite clear that there was excessive um, or excess number of suicides after the great financial, well, after the global financial crisis uh, in this study of 54 countries compared to the trends in the years preceding the, um, the financial crisis. And this is, you know, very much statistically significant. Um, uh, and particularly, those who are committing or were committing suicides were men, they find, uh, in countries with high levels of job loss. So there seems to be a kind of direct link between what is, you know, obviously a, a clear indication of social welfare in some sense and, and economic activity. Um, looking or going beyond suicide, we have other health effects. We, um, this sort of meta-analysis um, found... Uh, in particular, the worst effects on mental health, but also on fertility and morbidity um, after the uh, Great Recession or global financial crisis. Um, although they also report that traffic accidents and alcohol consumption decreased, which you might expect to some extent with less economic activity. They found that strong social uh, safety nets in some European countries uh, buffered those populations from negative health effects, which is clearly relevant from the economic standpoint. Um, but that's also the health of impacts they found were stronger among men and racial ethnic minorities. So this, you know, the effects of the recession are gendered and they are racial. And that's what we're going to look at in a bit more detail now. Here's data from the US again, and it's now foreclosures. So, you know, the properties that are taken off those who default on their loans or mortgages. And the rate of foreclosure is clearly much higher among the Hispanic Latino community and the Black African American community um, across the years. And this, in some sense, is not surprising, given that we know that uh, it, it tends to be, you know, Black ethnic minority um, uh, uh, people who are, who hold a lot of these subprime mortgages because they have no access to traditional uh, credit a lot of the time. In fact, a lot of um, yeah, and this is one of the findings of, of Gary Dimsky, who was writing with, I think, Hernandez and, and others, who uh, finds that, you know, the, a lot of these more safer banks, traditional banks, typically don't open up branches in low-income areas um, in the U.S. And um, due to the historical reasons and structural reasons, low-income areas typically, or uh, a lot of the poor in America also happen to be black. Um, and of an ethnic minority background. So this is sort of, you know, 
the only lenders are in some sense the loan sharks in these areas, um, it's, it leads to yeah, higher rates of subprime mortgages and therefore higher rates of foreclosures later on, which is almost the opposite problem of, of, the, of what was traditionally the case where minorities are financially excluded. They now become what they call super included um, with, this, uh, with these predatory lenders seeking new subprime customers. So there's a clear racial element here as well. Um, uh, this video is going on for a while, so I, I won't go into too much detail here, but here we see that uh, depending on what area, so census tract is the, the area where the census in America is held, and if it is um, predominantly non-white, then we find that here for women, uh, and here we have African-American women at the top here, they are more likely to be having subprime or uh, high cost loans. Yeah. So in areas dominantly um, with non-black, uh, sorry, non-white people, so ethnic minorities, we have more subprime mortgages, um, which kind of confirms the suspicion that you know, there's no other access to other kinds of credits in these areas. Uh, if things taken into account is that for women, all these lines that you see here is simply shifted up so essentially, the prevalence of, of uh, subprime mortgages or high cost loans is higher among women um, than men. So you see the same trends, but these are shifted up. So essentially, it's hard to be uh, a black or ethnic minority person in America when it comes to getting loans, but it's even harder than to be, you know, say, a black and uh, uh, a woman in America, as the data points out from, I think this was also from Uh, and lastly, on gender, uh, an important point to take into account is the effects of austerity. Uh, this study in particular finds that, well, austerity is detrimental to gender equality. Why? Well, because women are more likely to work in the public sector. And if you consider, you know, um, administration jobs or education jobs or nursing jobs in, in sectors where, in, in countries where healthcare sector is public, then yeah, women do generally tend to work in these sectors. And this is data from the OECD, which confirms this suspicion. So 70% of public sector jobs in Sweden are held by women. So austerity where, you know, these wages are cut or jobs are lost um, or cut, um, yeah, they, that disproportionately affects women. More than that, um, because of the prevalent social norm of women as a primary caregiver, it means that if, you know, uh, let's say child benefits are cuts, um, it puts women under much more pressure than men. And so austerity can affect them that way. Or if women are going out to try and find a new job and employers have the perception that, you know, this woman that uh, I might hire may be so busy trying to look after their children that they won't have, you know, they won't be productive at the workplace and therefore that employer does not hire that woman. Then, of course, we have all these other um, implicit ways in which Austerity can affect gender, or has it, or has it gendered uh, um, dimension? Okay, it's time to conclude with some, you know, a summing up in policy, uh, some policy ideas. What was the Great Recession? Well, it was caused or driven by rising inequality and financial deregulation coupled together. Uh, it was exacerbated largely by these austerity measures that. Um, the demand for goods and services. Um, as we saw in the consequences, and I think this is really important to keep in mind when we discuss these economic factors, is that it really fueled, it seems to at least to have fueled these political political polarization that we've seen. And keep in mind the study that I mentioned is before um, Brexit, before the election of Trump. Um, so anyway. Uh, and the Great Recession is, of course, embedded in historical racial and gender inequalities that are perpetuated to this day uh, and, you know, fuel some of the resentment that we're seeing in the news this week with um, the killing of uh, George, uh, George Floyd and, and the, the debates and, and marches and, and uh, protests surrounding them. Um, policy implications? Well, again, a lot of it comes down to inequality and financial regulation. So rather than repeat that, I would just say, well, we see it as important for economic and political stability, not just for you know combating um, uh, secular stagnation and global imbalances. 
Let me add to that, though, the idea that, well, uh, we need to keep into account that financial inclusivity is important for low-income and minority areas, and ensuring that predatory lending in those areas doesn't take off is, is particularly important when we consider uh, the racial aspect. Um, when it comes to well, austerity, the, the disproportionate effect on women must be recognised, and in particular, if we were to try and make a more gender equal society or economy, then increases in public childcare facilities and capping the, the cost thereof, um, perhaps increasing child benefit payments depending on the economy and so on, must at least be considered. And when it comes to the Eurozone, as we saw with the sovereign debt crisis, well, we won't go into too much detail now because this video is long enough uh, and we will get back into it when we talk about public debts in time to come. But let me just say that if you have a sovereign government without a lender of last resorts, then you're going to have problems. And that is essentially what we saw with the case of Greece. Um, and there is clearly a role for ensuring that the Eurozone comes together fully in supporting those um, economies you know, that enter a recession or depression in the case of Greece uh, and don't have the ability to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps because they are financially restricted. So a, a jointly backed stability bond or euro bond would clearly have a role here in ensuring that uh, such economies have access to finance and are able to stimulate their own economies. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope you found it all very interesting and I'm very much looking forward to discussing these matters with you on Thursday. Um, okay, that's it for now. I'll see you on Thursday.